Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we're discussing the use of the phosphodiesterase inhibitors uh, to treat asthma. Okay, so we're currently looking at the pathology of asthma. Okay, so we've seen how uh, after your primary exposure to the allergen, what will happen is you will uh, generate a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction uh, to that allergen where the humoral adaptive immune response produces immunoglobulin E molecules that are targeted against an, an epitope of that allergen. Okay, now these IgE molecules will bind to the FC epsilon R1 uh, receptors on the surface of the mast cells and therefore you will mount this IgE that's uh, tailored against the allergen on the surface of the mast cells in the lamina propria and this IgE will remain here for months basically before it will be removed. Okay, so uh, now what's going to happen is you're going to get your secondary exposure to the allergen Okay, so you breathe in the allergen again uh, whilst the IgE is still on the surface of the mast cells, okay? So you're re-exposed to the allergen within a few months, okay? So secondary uh, allergen exposure. Okay, right. Uh, now what's going to happen is the allergen is going to go into your airways. Some of it will get into the lamina propria and bind to these IgE molecules on the uh, surface of the mast cells. And this will activate the FC epsilon R1 receptors on the surface of the mast cells, and that will then activate this mast cell. And now what is this mast cell going to do? Well, it's going to release four main pro-inflammatory mediators that are going to cause all the trouble. So it's going to release its uh, alarm signals, basically. Now, one of these alarm signals it's very obvious because mast cells are full of mast cell granules and these mast cell granules which are basically just vesicles uh, are full of histamine basically so mast cells have a large number of histamine granules within their cytoplasm okay now if you exocytose a histamine granule it's going to release a lot of histamine into the extracellular uh, fluid so when the mast cells are activated, it's going to cause the release of histamine from the mast cells. So you're going to get the release of histamine. Okay, but histamine isn't the only pro-inflammatory mediator that these mast cells are going to release. They're also going to release leukotriene B4, LTB4 for short. They're also going to release cystinal leukotrienes, cis-LT for short and also tumor necrosis factor alpha. So I'll write out all of these names in full in a moment. Okay, I just wanted to try and squeeze them into that line nicely. So LTB4 stands for leukotriene B4. Okay, uh, and this is a um, this is a molecule that is derived from arachidonic acid, which was liberated in the uh, phospholipid bilayer when uh, the mast cell was activated. So this is leukotriene B4, LTB4 for short. Cis-LT is short for cystinyl leukotrienes, okay? Cystinyl leukotrienes. Now, this is not just one molecule. There are a whole bunch of leukotriene molecules which all count as cystinyl leukotrienes. So let me bring this over here. So there are three cystinyl leukotrienes. Leukotriene C4 is a cystinyl leukotriene. Leukotriene D4 is a cystinyl leukotriene. And leukotriene E4 is also a cystinyl leukotriene. Okay, so these are the three different molecules that all count as cystinyl leukotrienes. Finally, TNF-alpha uh, stands for tumor necrosis factor alpha. Okay, uh, now this is a protein molecule which has to be synthesized from the, uh, well, synthesized from the gene within the mast cells, okay, when the mast cell is activated. So this is the uh, pro-inflammatory mediator that takes the longest to be released. Now, tumor necrosis factor alpha will often just be referred to as tumor necrosis factor. And the reason for this is that although there are other tumor necrosis factors other than tumor necrosis factor alpha, such as tumor necrosis factor beta and tumor necrosis factor C, okay, um, tumor necrosis factor alpha is easily the most important tumor necrosis factor. So if anyone ever just talks about tumor necrosis factor without clarifying which one they mean. You can assume they're talking about this one because this is the most important one. Okay, now
these four pro-inflammatory mediators are the main uh, four pro-inflammatory mediators released by the mast cells upon uh, your secondary allergen exposure. Okay, so uh, what's now going to happen is these ex uh, these pro-inflammatory mediators are going to trigger the allergic asthmatic attack, okay? Right, so what's going to happen? Well, the allergic asthmatic attack can be divided into the immediate phase and the late phase. Now, histamine leukotriene B4 and cystinyl leukotrienes are all released very quickly from the mast cell and they're going to cause the immediate phase of the asthmatic attack, which will occur within minutes, basically, okay? Whereas tumor necrosis factor alpha is released far later because it has to be synthesized and also it, its actions are very slow as well. So it's going to cause what's known as the late phase of an asthmatic attack which will occur a few hours after the secondary uh, allergen exposure. Okay, right, uh, so let's start with the immediate phase because that happens first and then we'll look at the late phase in a moment. Okay, so What's going to happen is that um, these three pro-inflammatory mediators, histamine, leukotriene B4, and the cystinyl leukotrienes, they've all been released into the lamina propria. Now, they will diffuse back and act on the smooth muscle cells, which, remember, surround the lamina propria. So around the lamina propria is the smooth muscle cell there. Now two of them specifically are going to act on smooth muscle cells, okay? So histamine and the cystinyl leukotrienes are going to act on smooth muscle cells. Okay, so let me draw this here. So here is a bronchial smooth muscle cell, okay? So this is a bronchial smooth muscle cell in the smooth muscle cell there, and now histamine is going to act on this bronchial smooth muscle cell and cause contraction. And also the cystinyl leukotrienes are going to act on the uh, smooth muscle cell to cause contraction. Okay, so here is the receptor, uh, well, a little picture of the receptor for histamine. So histamine is going to diffuse back and act on H1 receptors, the first type of receptor for histamine that is on the surface of these bronchial smooth muscle cells. Now, the H1 receptor is a GQ coupled receptor, okay, so it's coupled to a GQ heterotrimeric G protein, and it itself is a seven transmembrane um, receptor. Okay, now also on the surface of the bronchial smooth muscle cells, you have cystinyl leukotriene receptors. Okay, so this is a cystinyl leukotriene receptor, and there are two types of cystinyl leukotriene receptors that are known. Cystinyl leukotriene receptor 1s, and also cystinyl leukotriene receptor 2s. Now, both of them are on the surface of the bronchial smooth muscle cells, and they are both GQ coupled. So the cystinyl leukotrienes, leukotriene C4, D4, and E4, are going to diffuse back to the bronchial smooth muscle cells and activate the cystinyl leukotriene receptor on the surface of these bronchial smooth muscle cells. Both of these receptors will then activate the GQ pathway, which overall results in the production of inositol 1,4,5-trisphosphate. This then acts on uh, the IP3 receptors in the uh, endoplasmic reticulum, okay, so here's the endoplasmic reticulum, and basically you're going to get the release of calcium from at the endoplasmic reticulum because of the activation of these two receptors and that calcium that's been released will um, trigger uh, the contraction of the bronchial smooth muscle cell. Okay, so you're going to get contraction of the bronchial smooth muscle cells and we've discussed what happens if you contract the bronchial smooth muscle cells. You get bronchoconstriction, you get constriction of these rings of bronchial smooth muscle cells that surround the bronchus, okay, and uh, this is going to be transferred to the inner layers which will cause constriction of the lumen of the bronchus, okay, which will narrow the airways and this, remember, could be happening in absolutely every uh, bronchus that you have. Okay, right, so that's the first part of the immediate phase of an allergic asthmatic attack. The next phase is going to involve an inflammatory response. So, so far we've discussed how you get the contraction of the smooth muscle cell uh, layer. Now let's discuss how you get uh, the inflammatory response within the lamina propria.
Okay, so within the lamina propria, you have blood vessels, you have microvasculature. Okay, now there are three main types of blood vessel that um, are considered the microvasculature. So the first is what's known as a terminal arteriole. Okay, so let's call this here a terminal arteriole. Okay, so arteriole, the word arteriole covers a huge scope of different sized blood vessels. Okay, so to clarify that we mean an absolutely tiny arteriole, we put this terminal here. And why is it called a terminal arteriole? Well, it's the arteriole just before the blood vessel branches into capillaries. So it's the final arteriole that you have just before you finally branch into capillaries. So this is a tiny little blood vessel. Okay, so terminal arteriole refers to an arteriole that's just before the branching into capillaries. Okay, so here now are the capillaries. So I've drawn three capillaries here, and then they'll reconverge into what's known as a post-capillary venule. Okay, so again, um, the term venule covers a huge scope of different size blood vessels. So you put the clarifier there, you put post-capillary to um, tell people that you're talking about a venule just after the capillaries have reconverged. Okay, so these are capillaries here. So, terminal arterioles will split into capillaries which will then converge into post-capillary venules. But you must understand these two types of blood vessel here, these terminal arterioles and post-capillary venules, they are absolutely tiny. These are not arteries and veins, no. They're not the massive great things that you learnt about in anatomy. These are tiny, tiny little blood vessels. So all three types of blood vessel here will be in the lamina propria. And they're what are referred to as the microvasculature. I struggle with that spelling. Microvasculature. Okay, so the tiny blood vessels. Right, and they have extremely simple walls. So capillaries are tiny blood vessels. They are one cell thick. The size of the, these little tubes here is about thick enough to allow a single red blood cell to move through. And the wall of the capillary is made up of just an endothelial cell sitting on a basement membrane. So it's really, really thin. It's a tiny strip of endothelial cell with then a basement membrane. That's all that there is to the wall of a capillary. Post-capillary venules are the same as capillaries. They're bigger than capillaries. You can fit more than uh, a single red blood cell through here. But the wall is the same ridiculously simple structure. All that it consists of is an endothelial cell, like so, so here's an endothelial cell, sitting on a basement membrane, okay? That's all that the wall of these capillaries and post-capillary venules consists of, okay? Now, for arterioles, they're slightly more complicated. Again, they're a tiny little blood vessel. Only a few red blood cells will be able to fit through at once, okay? But their walls are slightly thicker, more complicated. They have uh, endothelial cells sitting on a basement membrane and then with uh, smooth muscle cells around the outside. Okay, so here are the smooth muscle cells. Right, so they'll have a thin uh, layer of vascular smooth muscle cells around them. Right, so what's going to happen is that histamine is going to act on the endothelial cells. Okay, so histamine will act on the endothelial cells, and it will trigger what's known as type 1 activation of the endothelial cells. So it will go to the endothelial cells of all three types of these microvasculature blood vessels here. The terminal arterioles, the capillaries, and the post-capillary venules. And it will trigger what's known as type 1 activation. Okay, and it does this by acting on H1 receptors on the surface of the uh, endothelial cells. Now, what occurs in type 1 activation? Well, firstly, uh, you get uh, vasodilatation of the terminal arterioles. Now, you might think this is a little bit odd, because surely histamine would act on the vascular smooth muscle cells and trigger contraction of them, just like it's triggered contraction of the bronchial smooth muscle cells, and that would cause vasoconstriction. But histamine is also going to act on the... Um, on the endothelial cells here, okay, and 
in the endothelial cells, it would trigger type 1 activation, and what's going to happen is the endothelial cells are going to start producing very powerful relaxant molecules. They're going to start producing prostacyclin and nitric oxide, and this prostacyclin and nitric oxide will diffuse back and cause relaxation, and their power is greater than the effect of the histamine on the vascular smooth muscle cells. So overall, what you get is vasodilatation of the terminal arterioles. Okay, which widens uh, the lumen of the terminal arterioles, and therefore you can fit more blood through these wider um, terminal arterioles, and therefore the blood flow through the lamina propria is going to go up. Now, that um, is going to contribute to the formation of the inflammatory exudate. Okay, so let me go on with what also is going to happen in type 1 activation, and then we'll see why this is useful. Okay, so it's important also to remember what is the body actually trying to do here, okay? It thinks that it has apprehended a most terrible pathogen. It thinks that this allergen that you have breathed in is absolutely terrible, okay? So what is it trying to do? Well, it's trying to launch a response that will protect the body from this terrible allergen, okay? So it's constricted uh, the blood vessel, sorry, it's constricted uh, the bronchi by contracting the smooth muscle cell layer to try and prevent you breathing in any more of this allergen, to try and prevent the allergen getting into the alveoli where prevent Potentially, it could go into the bloodstream and then cause septicemia. In addition, we've ca we're causing the inflammatory response in the lamina propria where the allergen actually is. And the whole aim of this is to bring troops from the blood into the lamina propria so that those troops can destroy this pathogen. Of course, the sad reality is that this allergen is not worthy of all of this. The body is launching a very powerful uh, attack, and they cost the attack against something that is harmless. Okay, so let's go on with what is happening. So, type 1 activation of endothelial cells is going to cause what is known as um, endothelial cell contraction. Okay, and this is where the endothelial cells contract a little bit. They get smaller, they retract their edges, and this opens up gaps between neighbouring endothelial cells. So if both contract, this one will contract this way, this one will contract this way. They'll open up gaps between the sorry, between the endothelial cells, and this will allow fluid from the blood to move through these gaps into uh, the lamina propria. Now, this is going to happen at the capillaries and the post-capillary venules. So, what you're going to get is you're going to get the formation of what's known as an inflammatory exudate. So, fluid from the blood is going to leave the blood and go into uh, the uh, interstitial space of the lamina propria, okay? Now, these holes in the endothelium are not big enough for cells to fit um, from the, well, not big enough for cells to fit through. So you're not going to get red blood cells pouring out into the lamina propria. Uh, but they are big enough for proteins to fit through. So certain proteins that are circulating within the bloodstream in inactive forms are going to move uh, out of the bloodstream through these gaps, and they're going to be within the inflammatory exudate, and these proteins are going to help with dealing with the pathogen. So, for instance, you're going to bring in complement proteins. The complement proteins will set up the complement cascades, and the complement cascades will help to attack the pathogen directly. You're going to bring in the coagulation factors, and as soon as you take the coagulation factors out of the bloodstream, uh, you set off the extrinsic and the intrinsic coagulation cascade, which results in a very powerful, uh, well, a very dense fibrin meshwork being assembled. And the purpose of this fibrin meshwork is to try and trap the pathogen in to stop it spreading. Okay, you're also going to bring in the components of the calocrine kinin system, and these are going to produce bradykinin and calidin, which are going to result in a positive feedback loop of the whole inflammatory response, because they go back to the endothelial cells and activate uh, the type 1 activation within the endothelial cells. Now, the importance of this inflammatory exudate being formed is that it's going to cause the swelling of the lamina propria, 
Okay, so here is our picture of the bronchus again. Now, if we're bringing in a huge amount of new fluid from the bloodstream into the lamina propria, the whole lamina propria is going to swell. This is going to press on the basement membrane, pushing it inwards. The whole thing is going to get pushed inwards. And the epithelial cells will also get pushed inwards. And this again is going to lead to uh, the um, constriction of the lumen of the airway, basically. So, we've had the contraction of the smooth muscle cell there, and also the swelling of the lamina propria, and both of these are going to lead to the narrowing of the lumen of the airway. Okay, right. So, um, finally, type 1 activated endothelial cells of the, in the capillaries and post-capillary venules are also going to start recruiting certain leukocytes. Now, leukocyte is just the fancy word for white blood cell. Okay, now the uh, repertoire of white blood cells that type 1 activated endothelial cells are capable of recruiting is pretty um, poor. They're really only good at recruiting a single type of uh, leukocyte. They recruit neutrophils. Now, neutrophils are the pawns of the immune system, um, to um, compare it to a chess game. Okay, so they are not a particularly powerful um, cell. They're not particularly good at killing pathogens, but you have an absolutely huge number of them, so you can afford to lose a few, basically. Okay, so you're going to bring in neutrophils upon neutrophils. Okay, so neutrophil recruitment. So the endothelial cells will grab onto neutrophils uh, that are moving through the blood vessels, and they will uh, move them from the blood into uh, the lamina propria. So you're also going to get neutrophils infiltrating into the lamina propria. And this is also going to contribute to the swelling that you're going to get uh, within the lamina propria. So you're going to build up effectively a pus. Right. Uh, and that's again going to lead to the obstruction of the airway. So that's the two things that... Um, that the immediate phase of the asthmatic attack has. It has this contraction of the bronchial smooth muscles cell there, and also this swelling of the lamina propria due to the inflammatory response that is occurring within it. Okay, now, I promised to go back to vasodilatation after I discuss these two. Basically, vasodilatating the terminal arterioles means that the blood flow through the capillaries and post-capillary venules where inflammatory exudate is being formed and neutrophils are being recruited is going to be greater. So the amount of fluid that potentially you can allow to leak out of the capillaries and post-capillary venules and also the number of neutrophils you can recruit is going to be greater because the amount of fluid that's actually being delivered to this site is greater and also the amount of neutrophils that are being delivered to this site uh, are also, uh, is also greater. So vasodilatation assists these two, basically, and therefore is also going to assist the swelling of the lamina propria. So the overall result of this immediate phase of the uh, asthmatic attack is that you get obstruction of the airways, and this could potentially be happening in all of your bronchi and bronchioles within your uh, lungs, basically. So obstruction of airways. Now, um, sometimes this can be very mild, okay, so you can only get a little obstruction of the airways that isn't too serious, but sometimes this can be really serious and can cause major problems with breathing. Okay, so, um, this leads to uh, wheezing, okay, so you can hear this. Uh, through wheezing, so their breathing will sound very, very funny, because you're now uh, forcing air to move from very narrow tube, and this makes a sort of whistling sound, uh, which can be um, heard as wheezing, basically, so their breathing won't be silent anymore, you'll be able to hear it. Okay, they will also feel uh, short of breath, basically, so it's going to cause shortness of breath, because they're not getting enough oxygen uh, into the alveoli, and therefore they're not getting enough oxygen into the blood, so oxygen levels within the blood are going down, and also carbon dioxide levels are going up within the blood, and you'll know from your physiology that um, usually the body will um, have elevating carbon dioxide levels within the blood, and also 
falling oxygen levels within the blood, and the one that's sensed first is the rising levels of carbon dioxide, because that causes a drop in the pH of the blood, the proton concentration goes up, uh, and uh, that then um, is detected, and that's what will make you feel short of breath. Usually, you don't well, you hopefully won't get to the level of oxygen where you're actually going to activate the uh, panic because of re reduced oxygen levels within the blood. Okay, so shortness of breath. And what it can pr precipitate, if it's very, very severe, is it can cause uh, too low levels of oxygen in the blood. Okay, so the uh, fancy term for very low oxygen levels within the blood is hypoxemia. Okay. This is also going to be accompanied with hypercapnia. So hypoxemia is too low oxygen levels. Hypercapnia is too high carbon dioxide levels within the blood. Okay, And if this gets severe enough, then you're not going to be delivering enough oxygen to your peripheral tissues in order uh, to meet their needs, and tissues are going to start dying. And then it becomes a race between the heart and the brain, which is going to die first, the two essential organs, which one dies first. Usually it's the brain. Okay, uh, so this can be fatal, basically, and when you die due to problems with breathing, there is a fancy word for that, and it's called asphyxiation, okay, also known as respiratory failure, so I'll put that as well, so respiratory failure, the respiratory system is failing the rest of the body. Okay, so that's the immediate phase of an asthmatic attack, and clearly it can be extremely dangerous, it can be fatal, and is fatal in many cases. Okay, right, uh, so now let's talk about the late phase. So this is the immediate phase that will occur within minutes of the secondary exposure to the allergen. Okay, now let's talk about the late phase. Okay, so in the late phase, the driving force for the late phase is tumor necrosis factor alpha, TNF alpha. So remember, there was this final pro-inflammatory mediator that mast cells released, which was tumor necrosis factor alpha. And this was the one that took the longest. And I've just realized that I haven't actually told you what leukotriene B4 did in the immediate phase. So remember, there were these free... Um, pro-inflammatory mediators, cystinal leukotrienes, histamine, and uh, leukotriene B4, and they were, I told you that they were all involved in the immediate phase. Now, I told you what histamine and cystinal leukotrienes did, but I never told you what leukotriene B4 does. So it's very involved in recruiting neutrophils, basically. So histamine is going to cause type 1 activation of endothelial cells, which will cause them to start recruiting neutrophils. Leukotriene B4 will uh, hugely potentiate the recruitment of neutrophils. So you will get massive recruitment of neutrophils to an area where leukotriene B4 is high. Okay, so it's involved in the formation of that uh, swelling of the lamina propria. Okay, right. So, the late phase, then, is driven by this fourth uh, pro-inflammatory mediator, which is tumor necrosis factor alpha, TNF-alpha. Okay, so TNF-alpha is a protein, so it takes much longer to actually produce and release than do the uh, leukotrienes, okay, uh, which are lipid mediators. And uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha will be released from the mast cells, so it'll go into the lamina propria, and then it's going to go and act on uh, the endothelial cells of the blood vessels. So it's going to act on the endothelial cells of the, of the terminal arterioles, the capillaries, and the postcapillary venules. And it's going to cause a type of activation known as type 2 activation of endothelial cells. So histamine caused type 1 activation of endothelial cells. Tumor necrosis factor alpha is going to cause type 2 activation of endothelial cells. Okay, now, type 2 activation of endothelial cells takes much, much longer than type 1 activation. The reason is that type 1 activation uh, doesn't actually involve any synthesis of new proteins. It uh, involves synthesis of a few lipid mo molecules. It 
such as uh, prostacycline, prostaglandin I2 up there, okay, it results it in the synthesis of nitric oxide, but all the proteins that are needed for type 1 activation are already present within the endothelial cells, so type 1 activation can take minutes, basically. Um, so that occurs very quickly, whereas type 2 activation takes hours, and the reason it takes hours is it involves the synthesis of a bunch of new proteins within the endothelial cells. So, firstly you have to wait for the TNF-alpha to be produced, then you have to wait for the tumor necrosis factor to actually trigger some result within the endothelial cells. And then, what are these endothelial cells actually going to do? Well, it's going to trigger all sorts of things, but the main one that's important for us is that it's going to allow these endothelial cells to recruit a whole uh, bunch of far more interesting uh, leukocytes than type 1 activated endothelial cells could. And the specific leukocyte that you're going to now be able to recruit are T helper 2 cells. Okay, so you're going to start recruiting T helper 2 cells from the blood and they're going to come into uh, the lamina propria. Now, where these T helper 2 cells come from is a bit of a mystery, i.e. we don't really know whether these T helper 2 cells are armed against the allergen that you that triggered all of this, or whether they're armed against other antigens. They might just be T helper 2 cells that happen to be uh, circulating within the... Um, within the microvasculature, i.e. they're just in the wrong place, wrong time, and they get recruited in. Uh, or they may well be uh, T helper 2 cells that are primed against some fragment of the allergen, okay? Uh, we don't really know is the answer to that, okay? But what we do know is T helper 2 cells from within the blood are going to be recruited into the lamina propria. Now, what do these T helper 2 cells do? Well, they produce two very important pro-inflammatory mediators, two very important cytokines. Okay, right. So, one of these cytokines is interleukin-5, IL-5, and the other is GM-CSF, which stands for granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor. It's also called colony stimulating factor 2. Now, I'm going to have to write the name of this out once, so I will do. Okay, so the G is for granular site, okay? The M is for macrophage. And then the CSF is for colony stimulating factor rather than cerebrospinal fluid. Okay, so granular site macrophage colony stimulatory, no, not stimulatory, stimulating factor, okay, is also called a colony stimulating factor 2. Right, so granular site macrophage colony stimulating factor, GMCSF. Right, okay, so what are these two um, cytokines going to do? Well, they're going to go up hugely in the lamina propria in this late phase of the asthmatic attack. And basically, these lead to the recruitment of another type of leukocyte. Now, which type of leukocyte is this? Well, they're going to lead to the recruitment into the lamina propria of a very dangerous type of leukocyte. Okay, one of the most dangerous cells the immune system has, and this is the eosinophil. Okay, so eosinophils are a type of granulocyte. Okay, so there are three types of granulocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, and also basophils, which <laughs> do very little. Okay, the eosinophils are very, very powerful. They uh, are the cells that your body uses if it is having to deal with a multicellular parasite. Okay, so let's say you've got some worm which the immune system is trying to destroy. No other cell in the immune system will stand a chance against this. Okay, eosinophils are what we use. Uh, they come in and they release horrendous cytotoxic proteins onto the surface of these parasitic worms, which then kill uh, the cells of the worm, and that's how they uh, aim to kill the worm. Okay, so, let me draw you a little picture of an eosinophil. So, they uh, are called eosinophils because they stain extremely well with the dye eosin. Okay, now eosin is a red dye, so they appear bright red if you stain them with eosin. So let me show you their structure. Their other characteristic feature 
is that they have this bilobed nucleus. So the nucleus has this odd structure where it has two lobes with a tube connecting the two lobes between them. Okay, so here are the two lobes of the eosinophil nucleus. Okay, and if I colour this eosinophil in red, you'll hopefully be able to see why people often refer to them, or often say, that uh, they look like a sunglasses clad, sunburnt face, because the nucleus with its two lobes like that looks like a pair of sunglasses, okay? And the red cytoplasm looks like the sunburnt skin. Okay, so they're often very easy to distinguish in histopathology because of this uh, dramatic appearance. I mean, other cells will stain well with eosin, but these stain bright red, so they're often very easy to distinguish. Okay, and I'm sure if you type in on Google eosinophil, you'll be able to get some beautiful histopathology up, uh, and you'll be able to look at that to your heart's content. Okay, right, so eosinophils are called granulocytes because they have within in them little granules, so little vesicles uh, that are full of contents, okay? Now, the granules of eosinophils are full of two horrendously cytotoxic proteins. So these horrendously cytotoxic proteins that the eosinophil releases onto the surface of the uh, parasitic worm. Okay, now what are these two horrendously cytotoxic proteins? Well, one is called major basic protein. A major basic protein is often abbreviated to MBP for short. Okay, the other very cytotoxic uh, protein that you have in here is what's known as eosinophil uh, cationic pept uh, cationic protein. I keep wanting to say eosinophil cationic peptide. I don't know whether you can also call it eosinophil cationic peptide. Maybe I think I must have heard that before. Otherwise, I don't know why. I'd be so um, driven to saying it, but I think it's called eosinophil cationic protein rather than peptide, ECP. So eosinophil cationic protein. Right, so um, there are these two very cytotoxic proteins within the uh, granules of eosinophils. So back to the storyline, these T helper 2 cells have secreted uh, these two cytokines into the leukin-5 and granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor. And these two cytokines are activating the recruitment of eosinophils. So, this is the experimental fact that if you have an area which has very high levels of interleukin-5 and granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor, you end up with a recruitment of eosinophils. You end up with loads of eosinophils there. The question as to how this occurs is still foggy, basically. The interleukin-5 and granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor, you would think that they would go and act on the endothelial cells, trigger some change in the endothelial cells, which would then be able to start recruiting eosinophils. However, the receptors for these two cytokines appear to be on the eosinophils rather than the endothelial cells. So the change appears to be occurring on the eosinophils. Okay, so it seems the eosinophils pass through the blood vessels in the lamina propria, get exposed to the interleukin-5 and the granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor, undergo some change, and they can then be recruited by the endothelial cells. However, that's still very foggy, basically. Basically. Okay, but something uh, causes eosinophils to flock to the area where there is high interleukin-5 and granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor. Okay, now once they're there, they get activated by these two cytokines as well. So the interleukin-5 and granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor. As I said, the eosinophils have receptors on the surface for these, and they'll be activated by them. Okay, and what does interleukin-5 and granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor induce the eosinophils to do? Well, you've guessed it. It's going to cause them to release their horrible cytotoxic proteins here. So they're going to start releasing major basic protein and eosinophil cationic protein. Now, this would be great if we actually did have some extremely dangerous pathogen in the lamina propria that needed to be obliterated. Of course, the reality 
reality is we have no uh, such um, incredibly dangerous pathogen, but the eosinophils, this incredibly dangerous assassin, is still coming in and releasing these horrors. So what dies, basically? What does the eosinophil kill in exchange uh, for the uh, lack of the um, incredibly dangerous pathogen? Instead, it starts killing these epithelial cells, and this is how uh, repeated asthmatic attacks lead to the damage of the epithelial cells. Because every time you have an asthmatic attack, what will happen is these eosinophils will be coming in, releasing these horrible cytotoxic proteins, and killing a few epithelial cells, okay? So gradually you get more and more damage to the epithelium, and this can then lead to the exposure of neurons in the lamina propria to the uh, lumen of the airway and then uh, that can lead to uh, the, the development of non-allergic asthma. The reason being that if you say breathe in cold air or environmental pollutants or cigarette smoke, these stimuli can activate these exposed sensory neurons and now these sensory neurons can lead to the contraction of the smooth muscle cell layer and also they can lead to neurogenic inflammation so they can uh, release mediators which activate the endothelial cells just like the mast cells did so this time in non-allergic asthma these neurons will trigger uh, the immediate phase of the asthmatic attack rather than the mast cells okay but the process is going to be exactly the same so you will get the same result basically and that's how uh, allergic asthmatic attacks if you have them repeatedly and you get accumulate da damage to your epithelium uh, you can then go on to develop non-allergic asthma Okay, now these eosinophils are going to do slightly more than that. They're going to also release cystinal leukotrienes and also latent um, tumor, uh, sorry, transforming growth factor beta 1. But we'll discuss that in the next video.